welcome to the National Fair Housing Training Academy's National Fair Housing Forum titled Post-COVID Mortgage Forbearance Options and Preventing Discriminatory Foreclosures. My name is Kashana Hill, and I am the Executive Director of the Louisiana Fair Housing Action Center. Since 2015, I have led a team working to fulfill the Louisiana Fair Housing Action Center's mission to end discriminatory housing policies and practices through litigation and policy advocacy, as well as providing fair housing trainings and foreclosure prevention counseling. It is my pleasure to be here today at HUD's invitation, serving as the moderator of today's event. We do want to note that this forum features information and examples that represent the experiences of the speakers. As such, comments do not necessarily reflect the policies of HUD. Before we get started this afternoon, let's review some technical tips and instructions regarding today's event. TJ, over to you. Thanks, Kashana. If any of you do have technical difficulties with audio or, uh, audio or video today, we recommend that you first sign out of the webinar and then sign back in. And if you're still having trouble after that, you can request help in the Q&A box located on the Zoom panel section at the bottom of your screen, or you can send an email to nafta at cloudburstgroup.com. We encourage you to ask questions. You can enter your questions at any time by selecting the Q&A button on the Zoom panel. Please note that due to time constraints, we may not be able to respond to every question today. The webinar is scheduled for two hours and is being recorded. The recording and the transcript will be made available on the NAFTA website on HUD Exchange, along with resources that supplement today's conversation. Back to you, Kishona. Thank you, TJ. As we move on, I'll share the learning objectives for today's forum. Together, we will know more about the fair housing foreclosure effects of the pandemic on people of color and others in protected classes, know the current status of the federal foreclosure moratorium, know more about current foreclosure and loss mitigation assistance programs, understand the legal standards for combating foreclosure as a fair housing violation, have tools to stop foreclosures that violate fair housing laws, know more about potential partnerships between FIP and FAP agencies and local legal aid and housing counseling organizations. At this time, I'd like to introduce our panel speakers. We are very eager to learn today from the experiences of the speakers whose bios are available on the forum page of the NAFTA website. Joining us today, we have Nikitra Bailey, David Sanchez, Rachel Jabal, and Deputy Assistant Secretary David Berenbaum. The panelists will introduce themselves and share a bit about the organizations as they speak. Later in the forum, I will ask a few free-flowing questions of each panelist and then open it up to other panelists for additional comments. I'd also like to remind everyone attending today that during the roundtable discussion, you will all have the opportunity to submit questions that we will do our best to address. However, please note that all questions will not be answered. Personal questions are not able to be addressed. And if you are in need of assistance regarding a homeowner foreclosure, please call the hotline at 888-995-HOPE. That's 888-995-4673. You can submit questions at any time during today's discussion via the Q&A box. Also, as a reminder, this event is being recorded and all materials, including the slide deck and the event recording will be available on the forum page on the HUD exchange soon after the event. We'll make sure to share the link to that page throughout today's discussion. With that, I am now going to hand things over to our first panelist, Nikitra. Thanks, Kashana. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nikitra Bailey, Senior Vice President of Public Policy at the National Fair Housing Alliance. 
The National Fair Housing Alliance is the voice of fair housing. NAFA works to eliminate housing discrimination and to ensure equal housing opportunity for all people through leadership, education, outreach, membership services, public policy initiatives, community development advocacy, and enforcement. My remarks today will provide an overview of the foreclosure process, highlight the devastating impact of the pandemic on hardest hit communities of color, and discuss policy options that can help prevent discriminatory foreclosures in black and brown communities. Next slide, please. A little bit first about the foreclosure process. We know that the foreclosure process is the legal process by which the mortgage creditor sells the secure property through a public sale, often referred to as an auction, to enforce payment of the mortgage debt. The foreclosure process is very state specific and depending upon the jurisdiction, it may be judicial or non-judicial procedure. And it's really important as we talk about which type of process your state uses is to know the difference between judicial and non-judicial. Some of the critical things to know about judicial is that this operates as a lawsuit against the borrower. So a summons must actually be served after the complaint, and then the borrower will have a specific number of days to file an answer or respond to the complaint. There's also an opportunity then um, for the creditor or its agent to make sure they prevail in litigation and to obtain a judgment of foreclosure against the borrower and an order of sale. So it's really important in a judicial foreclosure to make sure that the borrower that you're advising has access to an attorney. And a non-judicial foreclosure, the lien instrument is a deed of trust and that within itself has the power of sale. So here the creditor is not required to file a complaint in court. They actually just have to follow respective state law on foreclosure procedures, such as filing in land records and serving the borrower with a notice of default. So the creditor here can proceed to sell the property pursuant to the power of sale in the deed of trust unless the borrower obtains a court order known as an injunction prohibiting the sale. So again, it's really critical in this instance to know which type of state your um, borrower is in. So we know that in some states, um, there are agencies that actually have in-house relationships with counsel and mortgage default servicing within the agency itself. However, in other states, the agencies actually use referrals. So it's really critical here to make sure that if you're making a referral, you've made an effort to update your list of legal aid providers and your pro bono networks so that as borrowers reach out for assistance, they can be guided to the necessary help and support that they need. Next slide, please. So, here, I really want to talk about what's going on in communities of color. We know that COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted Black and Brown communities. Overwhelmingly, Black and Brown people work in the service sector, which has been the hardest sector hit by the global pandemic. We've seen higher incidences of personal illnesses and loss of life, as well as reduction in working hours and loss of pay. So we continue to see spikes in unemployment with Black women and Latinas having some of the highest levels of unemployment because of the crisis. As a result of that, we're seeing a disproportionate level of missed mortgage payments um, and seeing families show up behind in their mortgage payments. What we are really concerned about because of this and as it relates to foreclosure is everything that we can do to really help guide families and protect them from some of the potential scams that they might run into as a result of struggling with their mortgage payment. So part of what we're hopeful for and why we believe that the fair housing community should really pay attention to and care about what's going on in the foreclosure um, potential catastrophe that is before us is that we need to do everything that we can to really raise awareness and help people appreciate what help and support there is for them and their communities prior to us going over an unnecessary foreclosure cliff.
So we are encouraging everyone to really use this as an opportunity to just get out in your communities and to raise awareness for struggling homeowners to really help and guide them to be wary of any types of scams that might come their way. This is usually the time that we see communities just really bombarded with you know, scam practices that will entice them to possibly look at some types of practices that they think could help them to avoid um, foreclosures. One type of practice that we are likely to see is this notice around increasing filings for bankruptcy. Um, it's definitely true that if you file for bankruptcy during this time, it is likely to halt your foreclosure. However, it's very critical that community members actually work with an attorney, a bankruptcy attorney, to actually guide them through this process and make sure they're getting the necessary uh, relief and guidance that they need and to stay away from some of the scams that might say you can pay a certain amount of fees and we'll do everything to stop your foreclosure, um, which might not ultimately result in the resolution that, that they're hoping for. So getting back now to how COVID-19 is really disproportionately impacting communities. Next slide, please. When we look at this slide, what we see are the disproportionate levels of impact of families struggling to actually be able to cover their expenses related to their mortgages. We see that if you look at the column where um, Black Americans are highlighted, that there's a 19.4% uh, higher rate of these families who are reporting not being caught up on their mortgage payment. When you look at Hispanic families, it's at 17%. When you look at Asian families, it's 13%. So we see that, again, um, in communities of color, because of the reality that um, they have been hardest hit by this crisis, they are experiencing more difficulty with being able to keep up with their mortgage payments. And another really important factor that I want to mention here is, and, and we can go on over to the next slide, is that the CFPB has reported that the number of homeowners who are behind on their mortgages has doubled since the beginning of the pandemic. So we see 6% of mortgages were actually delinquent as of December, 2020, and that was up from 3% in March, 2020. So most of the delinquent loans, we have about 2.1 million borrowers were more than three million, three months behind on their payments, which signifies a severe economic distress, which is very, very alarming. So kind of coming back over now to the policy tools and kind of what it is that we can do to really prevent and combat discriminatory foreclosures, some very protective measures have been put into place to really help us try to, this time, avoid some of the calamity that we saw during the Great Recession. All of us remember that during the Great Recession, Black and Brown families were steered into dangerous and toxic mortgages, even when they qualified for loans on safer um, and more affordable terms. As a result of that, Black and Brown communities lost $1 trillion of wealth during that crisis and have yet to even recover from that crisis. So sadly for those communities, we see this crisis falling disproportionately hardest on some of the very hardest hit people who have yet to recover thus far. So we were excited to see some of the proactive measures this time to really try to help us to really avoid a foreclosure cliff because during the last crisis, foreclosures peaked in black and brown communities in 2006, two years before the Great Recession, and then you know almost four years before a lot of the relief came to really help our community members. So it's imperative that during this crisis, we use every tool in the toolbox to really help people to stay housed. It's, it's critically important to, to remind everyone that during this time, we're not out of the global pandemic. Um, we see increasing levels of uh, cases of COVID arising in some communities. Um, and, and we see some places where, you know, there are lags in vaccinations. So, so we need people to remain housed because of um, a public health crisis and also because we also don't want to see housing taken away um, 
from families because we know for black and brown communities, housing is typically um, home ownership, quite frankly, the, the, the most significant form of wealth that these community members actually have. So a little bit about the CARES Act. Next slide, please. So the CARES Act um, provides borrowers with federally backed loans, um, FHA, VA, USDA, Fannie or Freddie, the right to a forbearance and the ability to actually pause their mortgage payment for a specific period um, if they're affected by a COVID related hardship. It also established a foreclosure moratorium for federally backed mortgages. So the great thing about the CARES Act is that for those with federally black loans, there was this pause. Um, the challenge is, is that we know that there were many people, particularly um, outside of those federally black loans, who also need assistance. And while some lenders and servicers have followed um, the CARES Act provisions, not all of them have done so. And David is going to walk us through that a little bit more in detail. So I'll go to the next slide. Another great thing that has happened is that the Congress has passed as part of the American Rescue uh, Plan, the Homeowners Assistance Fund. So there is $9.9 .9 billion for mortgages and other housing related expenses, such as property taxes, property insurance, and other utilities. These funds are going to be administered by state housing finance agencies, and they're designed to assist borrowers who are not well served by existing loss mitigation programs. Again, we're gonna get into some of those details about what those existing loss mitigation programs look like. It's really critical as we talk about the Homeowners Assistance Fund that we um, get these funds out as Congress has intended. Um, we've yet to see the guidance that we need from the Treasury, so some states don't even have their plans um, up and implemented yet around these funds. So it's critical that we get that guidance so that these funds can quickly get into the hands of homeowners. So again, we do not lose um, kind of the losses that have been uh, projected. The next slide, please. So this slide talks about some of the policies that we need to really support some of the hardest hit homeowners. We already talked about increasing access to COVID mortgage forbearances. And a critical part of that is making sure we give borrowers the best post forbearance options best suited for their circumstances everyone's not gonna need the same solution. We also need to, during this time, encourage significant communication between borrowers and their mortgage servicers. This is the time where people need to be in communication. And in fact, we need to have over communication. We also need to ensure that we're supporting alternatives to foreclosure, such as short sales for those who need them. We know with this crisis that a lot of families actually are in homes that have appreciated. Um, it's a very hot housing market this go round as opposed to the last go round. Um, so one option is for families to sell their home if necessary. However, um, that's not um, something that should be taken lightly. We want to make sure, um, again, that the priority is on keeping families housed. We also want to do everything that we can to prevent the pandemic from negatively impacting um, credit scoring. We know that credit scoring is a major determinant and future credit opportunities. So we need to do everything during this crisis to make sure we don't set people up um, to a position that they suffer um, from negative impacts on their credit score, as this is a global health pandemic um, that is not the fault of any of us. The next slide. And in this slide, we're gonna talk about policies that we need to really improve um, property and community outcomes. So again, here we wanna make sure that we are prioritizing home ownership and neighborhood stabilization and de-stressed and REO sales. We know um, that we're likely to see about 225,000 to 500,000 actual foreclosures this go round. And it's critically important that we get these funds um, out so that we can avoid as many of these foreclosures as possible. But where we're not able to do that, we have to really have a focus on maintaining home ownership in neighborhoods um, in really um, hardest hit communities. And we need to do everything that we can to get these properties into the hands of owner-occupied um, 
occupants. So we need to also make sure that banks properly maintain any REO um, in communities. We know that historically communities of color have found that the maintenance of these properties has not been the same as it has been in white communities, which has lowered overall property values in our communities. We also need to make sure we prevent zombie foreclosures and aggressively address um, vacancy problems um, to make sure, again, that we are not designating our neighborhoods as more risky um, and less safe and, and making sure families get the relief that they need. It would be a travesty if during this crisis we see um, these kind of continued elevations of investors swooping in and getting access um, to the, um, the foreclosures in our communities, as opposed to making sure, you know, family members and people who live in our communities can actually occupy them as owner occupants with purchases. So we need to do everything in our power to make sure we get these homes um, back up on the market and for sale to the actual community members themselves, because it would be, again, a travesty if we leave this crisis in a worse position um, than we inherited it. And, and I'll close by, by just reminding us that, again, this is a crisis that is a global health pandemic. It's not the fault of any of us. And many of the members of Black and Brown communities are disproportionately in the service sector. So they've been hardest hit. So every measure has to be taken to ensure we do everything to stabilize homeowners themselves in our communities overall. And I'll pause there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikitra. That was a really great overview of um, how we got here and where we are and um, definitely already have some questions. So thank you so much for getting us started um, in our discussion today. Our next panelist, David Sanchez, will speak with us about the foreclosure moratoria, forbearance options, and assistance for homeowners. David? Thanks, Kashana, um, and thanks to all of you for being here today, as well as to my, my co-panelists for their presentations. Um, my name is David Sanchez, and I am the Director of Research and Development at the National Community Stabilization Trust. Uh, NCST is a national nonprofit that focuses um, on issues related to blight um, and neighborhood stability. We do that in a couple of different ways. Uh, the primary thing we do is we actually run a program uh, that makes distressed properties and foreclosed homes available for sale to uh, nonprofit and mission-minded uh, developers who uh, who rehab them for owner occupancy. Uh, we also conduct um, federal policy advocacy. I'm a member of our policy team um, around the areas of increasing access to um, affordable and sustainable mortgage credit, uh, to preventing unnecessary foreclosures and home loss, um, and then um, in the unfortunate cases when foreclosures do occur, um, making sure that we respond to those uh, in ways that that strengthen communities rather than weaker them. Um, so um, I'm really happy to be here with you guys today. I'm going to talk through a couple of different things um, as Kashan previewed. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of the current, current state of the mortgage market um, and um, the current state of borrowers in forbearance. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what happens, um, what we've seen so far and what will happen as borrowers exit forbearance, um, you know, uh, because the um, amount that a borrower doesn't pay during forbearance needs to be paid back one way or another. Uh, there is really, there is a threat of foreclosure if a borrower isn't able to sustainably do that. So uh, I'm going to talk through the state of, uh, you know, what's happening with foreclosure moratoriums, uh, what borrowers need to navigate as they're exiting forbearance. Um, and I'm going to say a little bit about the options that are available to borrowers uh, so that they can continue paying their, their mortgage as their incomes recover after COVID. Um, would you mind going to the next slide? So just for some you know, high-level background on the current state of mortgage forbearances, as of May 2021, uh, about 1.7 million borrowers were seriously delinquent on their mortgages. Um, and as Nikitra highlighted, uh, you know, the CARES Act, which was passed at the beginning of the pandemic, gave borrowers with federally backed mortgages the right to mortgage forbearances for 12, which has now been extended to 18 months. Um, this is for, uh, as Nikita mentioned, federally backed mortgages, which is about 70% of the mortgage market. Um, I would say that uh, for the remaining 30% of the mortgage market, borrowers uh, tend to have similar options. Uh, the private market has imitated the uh, forbearance provisions of the CARES Act, although oftentimes um, the length of time of forbearance that's available to a borrower will be shorter 
um, or um, you know there there might be a few of the a few of the other protections that are in the act might not apply. But um, when a borrower uh, needs a COVID related forbearance um, for everyone, and, and these these are specifically for people covered through the CARES Act, but um, you know the market is kind of applying these principles broadly. Um, you know, there's no formal ap application. Um, a borrower must simply attest to a COVID-related hardship. Uh, there's no need to document that hardship, you know, provide bank stubs, uh, you know, pay stubs or anything like that. Um, while the, during the time when the borrower is in forbearance, there are no penalties, fees, or interest charged beyond those that are regularly scheduled uh, under the terms of the mortgage. Um, and there are certain credit reporting protections, especially for borrowers who were not delinquent on their mortgages uh, before they entered into forbearance. Um, as of May 2021, uh, there were about 2 million loans, just over 2 million loans on forbearance, um, with the uh, highest concentration um, are FHA and VA borrowers. Um, the next highest are um, borrowers with GSE-backed loans. And then uh, within that 30% of the market that is not covered by the CARES Act, uh, there are about 580,000 borrowers who are currently on forbearance. Uh, next slide. Uh, this just gives a little, this slide, uh, a lot of, um, you know, the, there's the various sources for this kind of data. Um, kind of for simplicity's sake, I've decided to rely on the data from Black Knight here, which is, um, well, they, they have a lot of data on the mortgage sphere, but in particular, they also, um, they make the platform that many servicers use to uh, service loans. But um, this chart divides, um, like gives, a, give a, gives a breakdown of seriously delinquent loans depending on when that delinquency started. Um, and as you can see, um, for borrowers who went delinquent after COVID started, um, the vast majority of these borrowers have taken advantage of forbearance um, or now might be um, you know, negotiating a loss mitigation option with their servicer. There are only about 33,000 borrowers who are seriously delinquent who became delinquent after the pandemic began. However, uh, there are about 150,000 borrowers who were delinquent before the pandemic began um, who are not uh, either in a forbearance or taking advantage of loss mitigation. And, and these are really borrowers who uh, are, are at the highest risk of foreclosure as we come out of this crisis. Um, next slide. Uh, as borrowers exit forbearance, either because uh, they, they feel that they're ready to or because they hit uh, the limit of 18 months if it's a federally backed loan or um, or whatever the terms that in the, in the private market, whatever terms of the length of forbearance are, uh, the servicer has been asked to enforce by the investor. Uh, you know, a bar, borrowers come out of forbearance and they have to figure out, you know, what are they going to do? Um, how, how are they going to uh, you know, restructure their mortgage or make payments essentially to pay back uh, the amount that they weren't paying during forbearance. Um, we are at a really critical time uh, for the mortgage servicing industry and for all of us who pay attention to it in terms of the mass of borrowers who are exiting forbearance. Um, there are almost 600,000 forbearance plans that are expected to expire in September and October of this year. Um, and uh, Black Knight is, is forecasting that servicers are going to have to process 15,000 forbearance exits per day. Um, you know, if the options are streamlined and uh, if, if servicers are adequately staffed and well-prepared, uh, they, they might do a totally fine job with this. Um, I think given what we saw with, um, you know, kind of servicer dysfunction after the last crisis. Um, many of us are pretty scared about whether servicers are going to be really up for this task. And so uh, it's really critical that, um, that, they, that they do so and that they help borrowers in a timely manner uh, figure out what to do after forbearance. Um, so far, most borrowers who have exited forbearance have been, have been able to begin making their mortgage payments, um, but uh, a little more than half have needed help to do so. And I'll say a little more later about what that, uh, those options or that, that help looks like. Um, next slide. Uh, so this is just, I'm going to walk through a few of the graphics that were on the former slide, just in a larger format. Uh, this is the current status of uh, borrowers who have entered into forbearance. Uh, you know, many, uh, there have been 7.25 million forbearances in total. The highest peak number was about 4.8 million at one given time. Um, of those who have entered into forbearance, uh, a number, you know, Close to half are um, performing on their mortgage again. Um, we, in particular, we do see um, a number of really stress areas, though. And while they are not um, yet 
really uh, huge risks to the housing market in terms of increased foreclosures, these are the borrowers that we need to pay just attention to. So I would just highlight on the right side of this graphic um, that there are about 333,000 borrowers who have exited forbearance and are delinquent but are um, actively negotiating loss mitigation with their servicers. Um, and then there are um, about 200,000 borrowers who have exited forbearance, are delinquent, and are not currently negotiating loss mitigation with their servicers. And those are really the borrowers who are at the highest risk of foreclosure after forbearance. Um, next slide. Uh, this is just a, a little more of a graphic of when uh, we uh, expect forbearances to be expiring. And as I mentioned, we see uh, huge peaks in September and October of this year. Next slide. Um, and then this is a different way of cutting the data on um, how borrowers are faring after forbearance. Um, you know, the, those, those top bars, the red and yellow ones, um, are the borrowers who really are at the highest risk of foreclosure. Um, and we see a particular concentration of these borrowers uh, in the portfolio and private sector markets, which are those that are not explicitly covered by the CARES Act. So uh, that is definitely some place for, uh, for us all to be paying attention to over these next few months. Um, next slide. Uh, so uh, just in terms of um, the current state of um, forbearance and of foreclosure moratoria, uh, borrowers still have time to exit into forbearances if they are affected by COVID and having trouble paying their mortgages. Uh, the time is winding down, but, but borrowers still have this option and all they need to do is, uh, you know, if they have an online account, many of them can log in and ask for a forbearance that way, or um, you simply need to call your servicer and attest to a COVID hardship verbally. So. Um, in terms of uh, what's happening with foreclosure, um, the CARES Act established an initial foreclosure moratorium for federally backed mortgages. Those have been extended by the relevant agencies uh, through the end of this month. Um, and then picking up on August 31st, uh, the CFPB um, is going to be prohibiting foreclosures with certain exceptions on a borrower's primary residence, um, except for um, uh, so you know, and then one one thing to note uh, is um, you know you may have you may have noticed that there is a month gap between when the federal uh, foreclosure moratoriums expire and when the CFPB's proposal picks up. Uh, so uh, Fannie and Freddie have protected that they expect servicers to comply with the CFPB rule during August. That's a little bit less clear for uh, servicers of either private label loans or FHA or, v or VA loans. Uh, we have heard from our conversation that the biggest servicers. It do intend to imply volunt uh, comply voluntarily with the CFPB's rule, um, but I do think we do need to be paying attention to whether servicers are beginning to file foreclosure um, on borrowers um, really outside of the confines of the CFPB's rule. Um, while the CFPB's rule is in effect from uh, September through December, uh, they created exceptions or quote unquote off ramps where servicers are allowed to uh, file for foreclosure on borrowers. Um, and there are three of those off ramps. Um, you know, those will be, the exceptions are for abandoned properties uh, that are abandoned under um, a, a definition that's right in state law, um, you know, unresponsive borrowers, um, and then borrowers who have submitted a complete application but do not qualify for any loss mitigation options. So those borrowers, um, we will see uh, people in those circumstances proceeding to foreclosure in some circumstances this year. Um, of course, in January 2021, the CFPB's rule will expire, and uh, that is when we will really see foreclosure filings uh, you know, are projected to tick up. Uh, so that's when we'll have to be really paying attention there. Um, next slide. So, uh, you know, after forbearance, uh, borrowers need to make up their pause payments uh, and also uh, pay back any other amounts that are advanced by the servicer. Uh, generally, and this is not always true in the private market, but uh, generally a lump sum payment cannot be required. So a borrower can't be told by their servicer, you have to pay us back all that money now. Uh, instead, the servicer typically gives uh, a number of, uh, you know, an array of different options to the borrower. The first one is a repayment plan. This is for borrowers who can afford temporarily to pay more than their uh, mortgage payment was before they went on forbearance. And so you would just pay back your arrearages over the course of a few months. Uh, the second really uh, kind of like big option that a lot of borrowers are gonna rely on are something that's called either a deferral or a partial claim. Um, and they, they're called different things at FHA and the GSEs uh, or by different investors in the market. But essentially what this does is it takes all of the money that is owed 
and it places it at the, at the end of a loan of, of your mortgage um, in a non-interest bearing account that is essentially due you know, when you sell the home, when you finish your mortgage or uh, when you refinance your mortgage. So uh, essentially it just takes the money and, say, and says, you know, we'll get it back from you later. Um, the other broad bucket of options um, that are gonna be really important for helping borrowers are loan modifications. And those work differently than deferrers or partial claims because they take the amount is owed um, and they capitalize them into the loan and then the loan is restructured, uh, you know, perhaps by extending its term or lowering its interest rate or through a variety of other tools um, that really um, should be geared towards um, giving the borrower a lower monthly payment after the loan modification than they were paying before. Uh, that's not going to be true in all circumstances, but in general, that is the goal of the loan modification. Um, if a borrower can't get back on their feet through one of those options, um, most are going to look to home exit options and a Big difference between this crisis and the last crisis is um, whereas home prices really fell precipitously in 2008 and 2009, borrowers didn't really have a lot of equity that they could draw on. And if they wanted to sell their homes, they had to do, through, do so through a so-called short sale where the investors agree to accept less than the full amount of money for on the, that they're owed on the mortgage. Um, borrowers have options. Borrowers can Many borrowers will be able to just simply sell their homes. Um, while we don't think this is a great um, outcome in terms of involuntary home loss and forced move for families, um, they are better options than foreclosure. Um, and so simply, uh, you know, these home exit options um, are going to be part of, I think, how we, um, how, we, how we mitigate the negative impacts of this crisis, uh, even though, you know, I think for any household that can afford it um, and, and would like to stay in their home, um, you know, a deferral loan modification would obviously be the preferred outcome. Uh, there's also short sales, uh, which are um, in the instances where borrowers don't have equity or deeds in lieu of foreclosures where a borrower can simply um, kind of deed over their um, or sign over their, their rights to the house um, in exchange to avoiding foreclosure. Um, I'll flag two other issues quickly that are going to kind of pop up during um, as borrowers are figuring out what to do after forbearance. The first one is escrow shortages. Um, so borrowers who did not pay uh, into their escrow accounts, which you know typically covers taxes and insurances, uh, many of them are going to have to make up um, that money somehow. And in some circumstances, they can be handled by uh, a loan mod or um, a deferral, but in some circumstances, they can't. So uh, as you are helping your clients navigate these options, uh, that is something to pay attention to. Um, the last thing I'll say on this slide is... Um, uh, Rachel, in a um, moment, is going to talk a lot about the fair housing tools for preventing foreclosures. But uh, for those uh, who, um, you know, are housing counselors or civil um, civil legal aid attorneys, uh, there are also tools under RESPA, which is the Real Estate Settlements Procedures Act, uh, that you have to help your borrowers, including uh, requests for informations and notices of error. Um, and I'm happy to say more about that later. Um, uh, just. Uh, I'm going to talk real quick because I only have a couple minutes left about what the uh, options that are made available by um, the various investors for borrowers. So I talked about, um, you know, uh, deferrals and uh, loan modifications at Fannie and Freddie. Those options are called payment deferrals or the flex modification. Um, at FHA, presently, uh, there are um, a couple different options that are offered, um, a standalone partial claim a standalone loan modification, a combination partial claim loan modification, um, or a streamlined FHA HAMP that targets a deeper payment reduction for borrowers who need it. Um, these are, I mean, we think these are a pretty good suite of options. Many of our, them are streamlined for COVID. Uh, the question is whether um, in large part, either borrowers are gonna have the income to be able to uh, perform under these options or, and whether servicers are able to deliver them to borrowers in an efficient way. Um, and then just briefly on my last slide, um, so next slide, um, this is just a little bit about what the options are uh, for PLS or portfolio loans or VA or US guaranteed, I, USDA guaranteed. Um, I admit, um, I, I know the most about the FHA and the GSE options just because of what I've worked on in my career, but um, I'll be putting it in the chat or someone else will. Um, if you need to look up these details, the National Consumer Law Center has made all of the information about the post forbearance loss mitigation options for borrowers free on their website. It is chapter 12 of their mortgage servicing and loan modifications. 
uh, guide, and um, that is where you should go if you are trying to, uh, you know, help help anyone understand the options that are available for them and figure out how to perform on their mortgages uh, after after forbearance. Um, so I think with that, I will stop and I will um, I will I'll, I'll send it back to Nick Pashana. And thank you very much for everyone for listening. And um, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, David. Um, that is really going to tie very nicely uh, into what our next panelist is going to share with us. Um, so next, Rachel Jabal will speak with us about some case examples as well as legal tools that are available for combating discriminatory foreclosures. Rachel. Thank you so much, Kashana. My name is Rachel Jabal, and I am the supervising attorney at Brooklyn Legal Services with our Neighborhood Economic Justice Unit. We work with homeowners in foreclosure or at risk for foreclosure, like many of the homeowners that we've been discussing today, and we endeavor to incorporate fair lending analysis and enforcement into all areas of our advocacy. I put my email address next to my name here below my picture in Zoom, and um, you should feel free to reach out to me where I'm going to say, you know, talk about a lot of things, but, you know, we're not going to be able to get into everything. If you have an issue that you're thinking about or a case that you're thinking about, um, I love to think about um, how to address thorny issues um, or how to plead a complaint. So please do um, send me an email. I'm so pleased to be here with you today. As homeowner advocates, we know that a lot can go wrong for homeowners, as we've already, as we've already heard today. They come to us not only um, maybe COVID affected, but as we're looking at their loans, we see that the loan is unaffordable. Um, we see it may be modified previously with a principal balance that's really excessive um, with servicers who may not be following the rules that we've been discussing today. Um, as advocates, we have a lot of tools to work with. We have the consumer protection statutes, such as RESPA, um, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, regulations like the ones that Nikitra and David discussed today. You might have procedural problems uh, with how a foreclosure began or some pre-foreclosure notices that you can address. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is fair lending analysis of loans and foreclosure and the way to use fair lending complaints to assist borrowers. Could I have the next slide, please? So why bring fair lending claims in the forecl foreclosure context? Um, the first and I think most important reason is to hold the system and the players accountable. The mortgage market is steeped in discrimination and it has been steeped in discrimination for its, uh, the history in this country. And that goes to origination, it goes to securitization and how mortgages are held, and it goes to servicing. Um, and foreclosure practices themselves are often discriminatory and abusive. So it is very, very important that um, the market players who are doing these things uh, whether intentionally or uh, with a disparate impact, should be held to account and that those things should be called out. And, you know, hopefully we can change a system that has been this way for a long time and also provide relief for the victims. Could I uh, have the next slide, please? Another really important reason is that they are a very powerful tool to gain leverage for your clients. Um, there is a lot of reputational risk, obviously, for um, entities that really may not want to be called out for discrimination. Um, you may bring, if you're in a non-judicial state, you may suddenly find yourself when you when you bring a complaint in, in court, now you're in a lawsuit, or if you've brought a complaint in an administrative forum, now the, the brakes are on. And there's going to be a uh, discovery. There's going to be, they're going to have to produce information. And all of a sudden, things really slow down for your clients. Um, and they maybe have been hurtling towards a sale. And now they have the opportunity to maybe negotiate something that's going to be favorable to them. Um, they can also get really powerful relief in the form of damages um, and injunctive relief and attorney fees, which um, are very powerful for powerful uh, tools of leverage for your clients. Could I please have the next slide? 
So uh, this is a map here of New York City where I practice, and um, it, it shows the, the home foreclosure risk. And this map happens to be from 2018, but we've been tracking these things for a long time. And this is the way the map looks every year. And so when I talk about how steep the uh, foreclosure market is, the foreclosure practice is in discrimination, um, this is kind of what I'm referring to. Uh, the cross-hatched areas are communities of color in New York City. New York City is a very segregated place, um, like many places in this country, and the foreclosures are predominantly in communities of color. Now, that is not, you know, happenstance. It's not because the people who live in those communities have done something wrong. It is because what happened what happens every day and what's happened for many, many years is those communities were peddled very bad loans um, and have had very discriminatory servicing um, that has been targeted at those communities. Um, so when we say we want to hold um, entities to account, we want to hold them to account for this map. Um, and could I have the next slide, please? This is kind of a little bit of a, a dovetail map. Um, this shows uh, the top four conventional mortgage lenders in 2019. Obviously, we're, we're not exactly apples and oranges, right? Because maybe for the foreclosure map, we want to be looking at lending practices 10 years earlier, maybe five years earlier. But as I say, these maps haven't changed a lot in the time that we've been tracking them. Um, and you can see that the conventional mortgage lenders, the, the loans that might uh, might well be healthy loans for people are lending in the predominantly white areas of New York City. And you can see that these things start to create a picture of uh, where, where are the loans going, where, where are loans that might be healthy for people versus loans that are really extractive. And um, we're going we're gonna to look at a, a few maps uh, later as well so we can see how the, the, the bad, the predatory products are going to the crosshatched areas and, um, and, and not to those areas that you can see are getting um, the conventional mortgage loans. Can I please have the next slide? Okay, so um, there are quite a few sections of the Fair Housing Act that are applicable, and you're gonna have, in addition to the Fair Housing Act, you're gonna have your state uh, you know, fair, fair lending statute, and you may well have a local statute. In New York, we do have a city law as well. Um, but these are the sections that are applicable. Um, 3604A or F1, um, the failure to make housing, I'm sorry, I'm sorry uh, making housing unavailable. Now this might apply to a deed theft scam or to uh, an equity stripping loan program that your client is coming to with you now, or um, a, uh, a servicer who is engaging in servicing practices that are causing people to lose their home. Making housing unavailable would apply. 3604B or F2 deals with the terms, conditions, and privileges of sale, provision of services or facilities in connection with a sale. And this might, uh, this might apply to a loan that comes to you that had a discriminatory loan that applied to a purchase. Um, or discriminatory appraisal. And then finally, 3605A, which deals with residential real estate related transactions, including uh, loans that are secured by residential real estate. This is really going to apply to almost anything that you see in this context with homeowners. Um, residential real estate related transactions are really the, the bread and butter of what we're seeing for homeowners. I'm going to run briefly through a couple of prima facie tests. We're going to look at three of them for lending discrimination to give you a sense for what you have to plead. This is all in the slides and you can uh, download them after the presentation. So you do not need to uh, pour over this right now. Um, but first we have um, the four, this is a four factor test, which will look really familiar to those of you who have looked at these issues uh, because you see it not only um, here you have it from uh, Matthews versus New Century Mortgage, also in Barclay versus Olympia Mortgage in uh, the Eastern District where I practice. And you have uh, the four factors. The plaintiffs are members of a protected class that they applied for and were qualified for loans. The loans were made on grossly unfavorable terms and the transactions were discriminatory. And the court here says that there's they've 
previously held that the fourth element may be established with evidence of intentional targeting. Now it's this, I'm gonna, let's look at the next slide. Under the Fair Housing Act, you have intentional discrimination and you have disparate impact. And under intentional discrimination, you have disparate treatment, which is treating different people differently based on a protected class, and you have targeting, which is targeting a defective product or a defective practice towards a community on the basis of that protected class. So that fourth factor can really go to any of these, to intentional or disparate impact, it can go to disparate treatment or targeting. And so you can think about this in the context of the problems that you're seeing, that there's really a, a lot of possibilities in terms of how you can plead your case. You may in fact find that the, what comes to you looks like a neutral practice and that it looks like disparate impact and that's how you plead it and that's how you bring your complaint either in court or in an administrative forum. But when you start digging and when you get discovery, if you're in court, for example, you actually find that maybe there's some emails or maybe there's some um, advertising that shows really it's a targeted practice or that they were treating people differently and you can end up amending um, to bring in that intentional element. Um, you do not, you know, the, the what you bring at the beginning is only really going to be the beginning from what you know and what you can plead well. But I have the next slide. Now, in addition to that four-factor uh, test, there's also the Hargraves test, which uh, is a little bit broader and allows you to uh, to plead that the that the loan terms or the the, pra the terms of the practice are unfair and predatory, and that they were intentionally targeted on the basis of race. So this gets you a little bit of a, a of a broader flavor. Um, getting you to that predatory uh, term, which, you know, is pretty broad and you can think about a lot of the practices that you see, whether they're predatory and in fact targeted here on the basis of race, but generally on the basis of a protected class. Could I have the next slide, please? And finally, disparate impact, which is about a facially neutral practice that actually or predictably results in a discriminatory effect on a group on the basis of a protected uh, characteristic. And you want to remember that you do need to make a connection between that neutral practice and the effect that you're seeing. You really have to make that connection. Um, and as I said, you know, a lot of what looks like perhaps it's a neutral practice may, once you kind of start folding back the layers of the onion, may in fact be um, a targeted practice. Um, but this is absolutely um, a great way to plead your cases and really be thinking about what neutral practice you're seeing that actually and predictably has that uh, discriminatory effect. Could I have the next slide, please? Finally, um, just want to mention some tolling theories. Um, you're going to bring your case either in court or in an administrative forum, and each of those has statute of limitations, and that you should look, you know, obviously in the Fair Housing Act, but also in your state or your local statute, they might have different uh, statutes of limitations. But think about what are the tolling theories. Um, oftentimes when somebody comes to me and they have a really discriminatory loan, um, that's really that's been around for a while. Um, they do not know that they have a discriminatory loan. They did not know when they got their loan that it was being marketed to them on the basis of race. Um, they certainly didn't, they were given uh, documents that were really concealing the nature of their loan and not revealing it at their, as they're supposed to. Um, so the, these tolling theories are really powerful and very applicable. The discovery rule has to do with when the complainant or the plaintiff discovered that they have been discriminated against. Equitable tolling has to do with whether the wrongdoer in fact concealed uh, the wrongdoing. And continuing, continuing violations have to do with whether there is a continuing practice of discrimination that continues into the tolling period. Next slide, please. Researching your case. This is actually one of my favorite things to talk about uh, because in the area that we work in with homeowners, there's actually a ton of information that allows you to research your case. 
a client is going to come to you and they have a loan that looks like a really bad loan. Maybe it was made by a lender whose name you recognize from um, the, uh, the before the foreclosure crisis or the servicer. You know that that servicer has been treating people really poorly, not following the rules that we've been discussing today. So the first thing is your client's story and their documents. And you may want to do a request for information for additional documents under RESPA, um, just as David mentioned, and really understand your client's story, their closing, what's happened to them. If you're really worried about a foreclosure practice, exactly when they received their statements or when they received whatever communications, what communications that they had from the lawyer who's bringing the foreclosure. Um, also the real estate records, your clients and others. Um, and foreclosure records. So if you're really concerned about an LLC that's been buying up debt and bringing foreclosures, for example, something that I'm researching right now, I go to my e-filed records from New York State, and I'm going to look up that plaintiff, and I want to know every case that they're bringing. Um, and um, I might want to map it. Um, and so, and the real estate records that we have in New York are also digitized and it really will depend on your jurisdiction. Um, but you want to take a look at what was that lender doing at that time period? Um, and what, you know, when is this, uh, this entity been taking assignment of mortgages and what can you find? What can you dig into those records? You also really want to know your own local mortgage market. We looked at a map of New York. State, uh, New York City. And, you know, I've spent a long time uh, practicing in New York City, so I know pretty well uh, what's, what's going on there. Um, I, we do a lot of maps, and I, I highlighted this and um, put it in uh, italics because the mapping is really crucial. Um, and it's really important to whether it's kind of using your, you know, getting an art gift. Or, um, or finding somebody, a policy entity who's in your area who can do maps for you, um, is really to visualize the information and to include a map with your complaint is a really powerful tool. Um, when we're talking about originations, we also have Humda data. We have the websites of the, the companies. Sometimes you look at the website of the servicer, and this is a, a, a map that I hope to show you if I have time a little bit later. And it's all, the, the map is all foreclosures in, uh, in communities of color. And in the website, it says, oh, we, uh, we specifically look to purchase loans in uh, quote unquote urban areas. And, and you can see that, that they've really trumpeted on their website. Or has the, the, the uh, person who runs that company given a speech uh, where they talk about what their intentions are and their targeting? Um, what is their advertising? Where are they advertising? What can you tell? Um, in the financial area, there may be offering memoranda, securitization documents. Um, the SEC has a lot of information. Um, you may find that the government has brought litigation, either like a state attorney general or maybe the Department of Justice, and you can find those documents. And you can talk to your network of, uh, of advocates, lawyers, and, and housing counselors who know a ton about what's going on in your area, and then you can aggregate that information and really make a powerful complaint. And, you know, you're only limited by your imagination here uh, because there's really just tons, tons to look at and, um, and, and help you make your case and help you really understand what's going on for your clients. Could I have the next slide, please? So I'm going to um, take a brief moment to talk about a couple of, uh, of examples. I'm not going to have time to go through probably every single one of these maps, but I'll try to go through a few. Um, and so the first set of maps is about when you're looking at a, a, a foreclosure and you're really concerned about the uh, discriminatory underlying loan. So I have a couple here. Um, and we're going to look at a countrywide map that we use. Um, a complaint, a, a map from uh, a complaint that we filed against a reverse mortgage lender, and um, a map about um, WMC um, second mortgages. So if we could have um, the next slide, please. So this, these are two maps of countrywide uh, refinance loans that we used in a series of complaints. We had uh, 
we we get a lot of countrywide loans still, loans that are sticking around that maybe have never been modified. Um, the particular uh, case that we were seeing uh, come to us over and over again recently is interest only loans that were interest only for 10 years and made in like 2007, 2008. So what we were getting was people who really kind of didn't understand their loan up until that moment they were sued in foreclosure in 2018. And so, uh, we're looking at, uh, in order to really make this case, we're looking at countrywide, the lawsuits that uh, the Department of Justice filed against them. We're looking at these maps. Um, we're looking at um, things that the Mozilla said about his own targeting speeches that he made in which he said, I'm targeting communities of color. Um, they were really uh, very open about it. And in order to make that case, and um, get some leverage for this client and get them a modification, get them um, damages for a really destructive loan that, that they got. Could I have the next slide, please? Here's another example of an origination issue that presented itself. Um, you can see this is uh, loans made by a company called Residential Home Funding Corporation, and they made uh, this is FHA lending that made reverses and non-reverses. Um, and these are really focused in communities of color. Um, now, uh, I'm looking not only at this map, but at the, at the story that my client is telling me about me about how her reverse mortgage was not only, uh, not only she had one, but that she was quote unquote churned into a second, which is a violation of the uh, reverse mortgage rule how she was visited at her home by somebody who was uh, doing door knocking and specifically soliciting her um, by repeatedly visiting her um, at her home and um, looking at this company and doing a lot of internet searches and trying to see, you know, and the, and the specific person who came to her house in order to make uh, a complaint that will really um, show that this company was targeting her um, on the basis of race. And could I have the next slide, please? I just wanted to um, present this again, just to uh, show you the contrast between, for example, the last two maps, which were about countrywide and this reverse mortgage lender, which you can show, you can see were really focused in those cross-hatched areas and these con conventional mortgage lenders who are really uh, avoiding the cross-hatched areas and how uh, though that story is about, you know, it's those conventional lenders who really make a vacuum. And then what comes in there is a predatory lending, which just continues um, into the present day uh, of uh, really destructive loans um, in communities of color. And can I have the next slide, please? And then this um, is another strategy um, that we use for somebody who is um, student foreclosure with a WMC mortgage. WMC was really notorious for making predatory loans. You can see on the left, um, first lien mortgages, on the right, second lien mortgages, because um, WMC made a lot of uh, what we call like 80-20 or piggyback loans where they would make two loans on the same property. In this case, just based on the constellation of what was going on for this client, we didn't bring a separate complaint, but we did assert it as a uh, as a defense in foreclosure that the lender was not behaving in an equitable manner because they had taken this predatory loan that was obviously predatory, and we they they did not come to the court with clean hands. They had unclean hands. So it's an equitable argument that we were using that discrimination and using this math and a lot of other information about WMC to make that argument. So it's just another way um, to really bring that, that fair lending knowledge into your uh, foreclosure practice. Next slide, please. And I just wanna wrap up with just some, a few uh, examples about discriminatory servicing and foreclosure. Um, because it, your case may come to you, it may present an origination problem, it may also present a servicing problem. So um, if I could have the next slide, please. Here we have a discriminatory serving, servicing complaint that we did file for quite a few, uh, quite, a, quite a few complainants based on this lender called, um, well, it's, a, it's an entity that was 
purchasing existing loans, Great Ajax Corp. And their uh, proprietary servicer, Gregory Funding, which is a really predatory servicer. And looking at their website, this is the one that said that they specifically focus in urban areas. And they would, they have a, a pattern and practice of specifically purchasing loans in for, that are already in foreclosure. Now we looked and we saw that uh, foreclosures are disproportionately in communities of color in New York City. And so this may be, maybe we structure it as um, targeting because of the way they talk about their own practice. And maybe we structure it when we talk about it in terms of disparate impact that they have a neutral practice of purchasing loans in communities of that, excuse me, in uh, that are in foreclosure. And those loans are disproportionate, disproportionately in communities of color. And then they service them in a really abusive way. They don't provide any of the options right, that Nikitra and David talked about, and they really force people into uh, a completed foreclosure and a sale. And um, just to talk about it, uh, just to mention a few other uh, things that we've been looking at, we've been looking at um, second mortgages, those 20% mortgages that we looked at for WMC um, are, are really kind of coming to, the, coming to the surface. Who's been buying them? Um, those loans were were made were almost entirely in communities of color. So those loans are themselves really um, discriminatory at their core, who's servicing them. Um, there's just a lot of um, possibilities and the things that are coming to you. A lot of, um, if you scratch, the, I would say if you scratch the surface, you really find a discrimination issue in the uh, mortgage market. But the truth is um, oftentimes, unfortunately, you don't even need to scratch the, scratch the surface. And I will go ahead and, and hand it back over to Kushana. Thank you so much, Rachel. Really appreciate that. Um, it's always nice to have sort of the legal perspective so that folks know what options are out there um, as well. So um, with that, we will continue the conversation um, and hear from our final panelist, Deputy Assistant Secretary David Berenbaum, who will share information with us about partnerships that are available to combat discriminatory foreclosures. David. Thank you so much, Kashana. And it's my pleasure to be here with you, the National Fair Housing Training Academy, and our fair housing colleagues today. As leaders in the fair housing and also the housing counseling space, each of us must play an important role in creating a real estate and housing finance marketplace where every individual and family enjoys equal housing opportunity and the chance to experience the benefits of sustainable homeownership in a society free of discrimination. HUD and the Office of Housing Counseling Team and the over 1,650 HUD approved housing counseling organizations across the nation look forward to actively partnering with you. And yes, I'm gonna use the words, affirmatively furthering fair housing so that our initiatives work to break down barriers to home ownership, access and choice for communities of color and all protected classes and groups. We are committed to ensuring racial equity in housing, narrowing the racial wealth gap and moving the nation beyond the pandemic through our housing initiatives. It's a new day at the United States Department in Housing and Urban Development. Fair housing, legal service groups, health providers, housing counseling agencies, and a host of other public and private sector groups across the country have come together to create a significant safety net to ensure sustainable home ownership. And I'm also going to touch on tenancy, applying the CARES Act, the Homeowners Assistance Fund, and the American Rescue Program. There is also unprecedented interagency collaboration. For example, between HUD's Office of Housing, the Office of Housing Counseling, FHEO, and the CFPB to bring resources to bear. Rachel, David, and Akitra have already done a wonderful job in their presentations summarizing some of the, the existing uh, relief efforts, the status of some of the efforts to ensure sustainable home ownership, as well as legal protections that are afforded to consumers today. 
I want to spend a few minutes speaking to you about the Office of Housing Counseling, some of our initiatives, and as was noted, the partnering activities that are available that we all can be working together. Many of you know that the Office of Housing Counseling was stood up uh, after the Dodd-Frank relief bill was passed, now almost a decade ago. Our mission is to help families obtain, sustain, and retain their homes. We accomplish this through a network of HUD approved agencies, as I noted, over 1,650 organizations who provide their work through a cohort of certified housing counselors. Now there's a lot of resource information on the HUD exchange and also on the HUD website. I direct you to visit those at your leisure. The links are on the PowerPoint that have been shared with you. As well, we provide grant funding to focus in on priority areas which I'll cover briefly in this presentation. We provide technical assistance and training, not only to the housing counseling community, but to legal service groups and the entire not-for-profit sector through our ongoing webinars, which also are listed on the HUD Exchange. Often our focus today, of course, is on pandemic relief and moving beyond the pandemic. And we have a series of recorded programs on all of the various relief efforts underway from the GSEs, FHFA, FHA, uh, veterans, and so on that are available for you to watch on demand. Now, as we move forward, we're also working to certify housing counselors. And I'll speak to that during the presentation. In fact, the deadline for certification is August 1st of this year, and we're making great progress towards achieving that. But more significantly, we are working to build the capacity of housing counseling organizations, their talented staff, to work with you in the fair housing space. Let's go on to the next slide. We've been doing that through a number of means, most notably as was noted, the importance of marketing and educating consumers to the availability of services that are available to them currently. We have both our own uh, website and social media outlets where individuals can find a housing counseling agency and dial both the toll free number, which is about to receive a very significant improvement to direct consumers to national intermediaries, state housing finance agencies, and local housing counseling organizations who provide foreclosure prevention and other services in multimodal ways, meaning virtual, telephonic, and face-to-face -face and group sessions. Next slide, please. And of course, we're also working with the CFPB, who similarly has a database on their website and on many of their publications, like HUD, that have been done in co collaboration with a host of federal agencies. Next slide. Housing counseling services are quite robust. The core of all counseling sessions is a very detailed assessment of an individual's financial situation and the recommendation of a budget to move forward. We offer counseling in a host of areas, many of which are beyond the topics of today's uh, program with the uh, National Fair Housing Training Academy. But for the purposes of today, I'll share with you that mortgage default resolution, also homelessness counseling, particularly with veterans and low to moderate income consumers of color, eviction counseling and reverse mortgage are all on the increase, particularly over the last few months. There's also classroom and group education and in both the individual and group sessions, fair housing is an active component of what our organizations provide. Next slide, please. In fiscal year 20, we actually reached approximately 960, 100,000 consumers. That was a little bit of a drop, but keep in mind the pandemic created a need to move from face-to-face -face counseling across the country to virtual or telephonic. And of course, they're also impacted the workplace and all nature of businesses, social uh, enterprise or for-profit across the country. What's very interesting is if you look in the trends for this chart for fiscal year 20, it's not surprising that in fact, pre-purchase counseling, both in individual sessions, as well as in situations dealing with group education was the most prevalent form of counseling. Consumers at all income levels, and particularly the demographics of our consumers each year are about 70% African-American, Black, Latinx, or Asian Pan Pacific uh, Islander. They were taking advantage of low interest rates and engaging with housing counselors across the country. 
This year, we're already trending well above that. We expect to be well over 1 million consumers canceled. And as I noted, our 9902 forms, how we capture reporting data from our agencies, show a tremendous increase, particularly in eviction. And now as we're approaching the expiration of some of the forbearance agreements, more and more in the area of sustainable home ownership or foreclosure prevention. We're almost ready for this perfect storm. We have been offering technical assistance and training to our counselors. And many of you are aware of Congress's appropriation of $100 million through the Neighborhood Reinvestment Corp, NeighborWorks America, to provide housing counselors additional resources to conduct foreclosure prevention activities. Next slide, please. So of our agencies, we collaborate on a national and multi-state basis with what's called intermediaries. Many of you know who they are, UNIDOS, uh, the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. There are in fact over 20 of them that are active in this space. We also fund and collaborate with over 22 and a growing number of state housing finance agencies who all pass through sorely needed funds to local housing counseling groups who are right on the front lines right now providing services. The requirement, of course, for these agencies is that they must be a 501c3, and also they must meet the definition of being a HUD-approved housing counseling organization, which again, if you're interested in that, can be found on the HUD website and also on the HUD exchange. Next slide, please. So our organizations are committed to advancing fair housing. Over 500 of them right now are also working in various ways to affirmatively furthering fair housing. Many FHO stakeholders, in fact, FIPS and FAPS, are also HUD-funded housing counseling organizations. The Fair Housing Council of Riverside County, Long Island Housing Services, Metro Fair Housing Services, to mention a few, are in fact air folks who are providing services both in fair housing and housing counseling. And from my own experience over 30 years of working in the space, I firmly believe that the issues presented to housing counselors serve as an early warning system to all of us in the fair housing space as well as emerging issues. For example, issues with regard to predatory and discriminatory appraisals, issues with the undervaluation of homes in African-American and Latino communities with regard to refinance, which steal equity and wealth on an intergenerational basis from the cons consumers and the communities that we serve. So as well, uh, during fiscal year 20, I'll note that over 300,000 families learned about their fair housing rights, about fair lending, or about access accessibility issues from, in fact, HUD participating housing counseling organizations, and would like to see that number grow. Next slide, please. So housing counseling, as I noted, includes budgeting. It includes extensive intake to get a sense of a client's situation. It includes a real analysis of what will be an action plan for success for the individual or a family, and critically includes follow-up with the client. A new focus of the office in particular this year is to ensure that our consumers receive culturally sensitive and linguistically appropriate counseling services. Again, the modality is less important than the quality. We want to make sure that our consumers, whether they're being counseled over the phone or in a face-to-face -face basis, have the best in class services that are available to them, but also in the language and also with the appropriate information that is appropriate. Someone who lives in Brooklyn, New York is very different to someone who lives in the Navajo Nation. Someone who lives in a rural area of Appalachia needs a different type of service than someone who is in Milwaukee and so on. There are many different approaches to this, and we want to make sure that every constituency, whether it be Asian, Latinx, or others, are receiving, again, appropriate counseling delivered in a way that really meets the need of the consumer moving forward. Next slide, please. Certification. You've been hearing about certification, and in fact, a year ago, so the certification deadline was extended to August 1st of this year. I'm happy to report to you that, in fact, we are well on our way to realizing a very successful outcome. 
Uh, August 9th through the 12th, the, the Office of Housing Counseling will be having our National Community Housing Conference, and that is about to be announced today for registration. Uh, it will be announced through the HUD.gov site, as well as through our own interactive uh, programming and, and uh, distribution lists. Uh, but at the program as well, we're going to give a full report out on where we stand today. I'm happy to report that, in fact, as of today, over 88% of housing counselors have realized certification. Of the 12% that remain, they represent less than 1% of that national caseload I spoke to earlier. So we are making great progress of realizing full professional certification. What was the purpose of certification? Under Dodd-Frank, it was to ensure that consumers received best information possible from highly trained professionals who were capable and who were in fact giving consumers information to combat at the time, the fraud, the problematic lending, the toxic products from the financial crisis. Today, the goals remain the same. We look forward to 100% certification moving forward. And in fact, a cohort of uh, onboarding for new counselors that are coming into the profession that will elevate the role of counseling and be viewed in the same way as realtors, as realtists, as mortgage bankers and brokers, and become an active part of the entire housing finance and real estate communities. Next slide, please. So again, our impact data can be found on HUD Exchange. I invite you to look at it. We update it regularly. Uh, and we also report out annually to Congress on in fact the impact of our work. We have a particular focus right now on in fact the pandemic and natural disasters because we wanna make sure that we have an immediate response to meet the needs of communities who we're serving. I'll also add that the data is helpful not only for housing counseling groups, but also for fair housing organizations to use, not only with regard to reports or information on the impact of our work together, but also a little bit more parochially with regard to grant applications to HUD and other foundations. All of this can be found on the HUD exchange. Next slide, please. So, I'm happy to share with you as well, you know, today HUD announced the availability of fair housing funds that are available to you. In the next uh, few weeks, the Comprehensive Housing Counseling NOFO will also be announced. Uh, and this year we'll be funding $57.5 million in support for housing counseling activities. And I'm particularly excited about a new initiative to work uh, to establish meaningful partnerships with historically black colleges and universities and minority serving institutions. It's a brand new initiative where $3 million has been set aside to reach the entire community surrounding these universities, offer more services, and in fact also create a channel of employment for the next generation of housing counselors. Stay tuned on that. The NOFA will be released in the very near future. Next slide, please. So I want to speak to rental eviction issues. Uh, it is related in many ways to the work we're talking about today. There are many homeowners, there are many absentee landlords, there are others who are struggling with their mortgages and it's impacting not only tenants in apartment complexes, but the very large number of tenants who are in single family homes. And we see emerging illegal eviction practices. We see emerging predatory or discriminatory practice in this space as well. And it's area that we're asking our housing council groups to focus in on. And we're collaborating with other offices at HUD, such as multifamily, such as single family, such as also externally with the CFPB and others to ensure we're providing information and support to address these eviction issues that in all likelihood are illegal. Our goal is to ensure that these consumers tap into the resources from Treasury and elsewhere that are slowly reaching these populations and to make sure that policy guidance and technical assistance tools are, are really meeting the need. Next slide, please. Outreach is a critical part of our campaign. For those of you who follow HUD or follow FHA, you've been seeing low, a series of uh, ads to reach out to the FHA consumers who are arrears uh, on their mortgage. 
Uh, and in fact, across all platforms, the Office of Housing Counseling has also developed an ad toolkit or booklet in over a dozen different languages for use by the housing counseling community. And I'll add they're very appropriate for use by fair housing groups as well. This is an example of one of the recent ads that has appeared on Facebook, LinkedIn, and a number of groups are using on their own sites as well, social media sites as well. Next slide. And this is also another example uh, of a themed ad. You've worked hard for your home. Now let's take the steps to keep it. That was earlier used uh, about three months ago that had a very good response. Again, these ads are available to you on the HUD exchange and they have had uh, a very strong response uh, from agencies that have used them. Next slide, please. So we've already heard in quite a detail from uh, our earlier speakers, uh, particularly uh, David and Nikitra, some of the steps that FHA has taken to try to sustain home ownership. Uh, I wanna speak uh, of a recent activity conducted by the Office of Housing Counseling. Uh, in early uh, May, uh, we were growing in concern that uh, there were over 340,000 FHA consumers who were more than 60 days late on their mortgage. It was our belief that these consumers would easily qualify for the FHA COVID forbearance program. As was noted, it was simple as calling your servicer and saying, I would like to participate in the program. But again, over 300,000 consumers did not take advantage of it. This was despite servicer outreach. This was despite various PSA campaigns and other approaches. For the first time in HUD's history, the Office of Housing Counseling worked very, very closely with FHA, with our servicing office, with single family housing. And on June the 12th, over 340, 100,000 first class letters were sent to every FHA mortgagor who was 60 days or more behind on their mortgage. We did this because at the time it was not clear what was happening with the extension that was noted earlier for the forbearance options. I'm happy to uh, report to you, I just learned in fact earlier this week, that that letter produced over 100,000 requests for participation in the FHA forbearance, COVID forbearance program. A very significant right party outcome in that program. One in which we intend on repeating as we move forward and as consumers begin to fall off, perhaps of uh, the efforts to ensure a transition from forbearance to new mortgage payments in the coming months. We're also looking at new and innovative efforts to ensure that consumers receive for, excuse me, foreclosure prevention counseling. And they also are referred to resources for sustainable home ownership. And that will include working very closely in new ways with the housing counseling community. Stay tuned on that front. I want to highlight that, of course, consumers can and should right now request the COVID forbearance. It is the most straightforward and easy and immediate relief for consumers. But I will note that moving forward, we are in active conversation and look for an announcement from HUD on more details on how the waterfall will provide even more support for consumers moving forward. Last, I, I want to also note the importance, we can go to the next slide, of what was announced earlier in June. And that is the opportunity for consumers to request the advanced loan modification. That can create significant payment, monthly payment relief, up to 25% for consumers on an existing loan payment. And what they are to rear them can be placed uh, on the tail end of a loan when in fact they sell a property or refinance. It is a very strong uh, step forward on the part of FHA. And we, again, we're take, planning to take more steps as was announced by the administration to ensure sustainable home ownership. Beginning to wind down, let's go to the next slide. Ah, I touched on new developments, so I'm sorry, it's a little bit of a tease, but I'm not authorized to speak to them yet. Keep an eye out. And the next slide. So we believe that that safety net of working with FHEO, working with FIPS and FAPS, uh, and in fact, working with advocates in all forms 
is in the housing counseling community's interest. In fact, many of the counseling organizations are strong advocates themselves in their own way. We also believe that we see many of our counseling organizations developing some very creative loan products that will be made available to give consumers a fresh start beyond the products that were spoken to in today's program. For example, NACA is developing with CRA support some very intriguing loan products that will be made available through their network. For all of this, you know, I invite you to visit the HUD Exchange webpage for industry professionals. Easy to find hudexchange.info backslash housing counseling or counseling, excuse me, and all of the other links that are available here. I also invite you to reach out to the Office of Housing Counseling. We can be a gateway not only for our work, but also other offices at HUD that are equally committed to this focus area right now. As I said, when I began my program, it's a very exciting time to be at HUD. S Secretary Fudge, her commitment to racial equity, the fresh look at existing programs, the focus on innovative and important outcomes, the equity assessment that's being conducted across HUD, we look forward to partnering with you to make all of this real and to make a difference in our communities. And I'll close by saying thank you for what you do every day in your community. Kishana, back to you. Thank you so much, Deputy Assistant Secretary Birnbaum. It's um, a real pleasure to have you here with us today and um, definitely appreciated you sharing the information and, and sharing with us everything that the Office of Housing Counseling has been doing um, to keep homeowners informed during um, the pandemic. And I absolutely um, think you're right about um, sort of how uh, housing counselors can really learn information that can help us in the fair housing field uh, get ahead of issues that we're going to be seeing. So I think that was a, a, a great point. And certainly from the FIP agency perspective, appreciate you making that, that point. Um, and so with that, we are going to transition into the question and answer session of today's conversation. And I want to just, before we start uh, actually answering questions. I want to remind everyone that you are welcome to submit any questions that you may have in the question and answer box. So please do um, share those questions and we will try to get to them. Uh, we have gotten several questions already that we will get to. We've also gotten several questions about whether all of the materials presented today will be made available. And so just want to remind everyone once again that all of the materials will be made available on the NAFTA resource page on HUD Exchange very shortly after uh, the event wraps up today. So you will be able to get all of the slides and all of the materials that you've heard about today. So uh, with that, we will begin to take some questions. And actually, um, Rachel, would I, I would like to start with you. Um, and some of these are questions that folks have uh, already answered maybe in uh, the Q&A box, but I wanted to discuss um, this question in particular here. There was a question about the kinds of remedies that might be available using some of the fair housing and fair lending claims when it comes to discriminate, uh, discriminatory foreclosures. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to that. Absolutely. So um, oftentimes somebody who's in foreclosure needs a modification and you may find that what you're getting is no modification or the offer is just not affordable or it's just not good enough. Like it doesn't reflect the harm that the homeowner has suffered. And so oftentimes actually a great modification is an, an outcome that we're looking out for. And it may mean, you know, there's a wrongdoer who is an originator and they're giving a chunk of cash to the servicer. So the servicer can do something better than they would usually do. Or, you know, your client can also, you know, maybe what they're looking for actually is, is money damages. Um, and that's a possibility. Um, you can, uh, get, getting out of foreclosure, obviously, is a huge, a huge thing that homeowners want. Um, and to be able to get onto their feet and really feel uh, that they have something that they can move forward with. Um, you can get injunctive relief. And, to, you know, if you were to litigate it to the end, that's something you would be more likely to get. 
Um, and um, you should be able to reform the loan. Now that's something, you know, you'd have to litigate it to the end and you have to get the, the trier to, to think, think about it. But there are, I think there's a lot of possibility um, when you're looking at a loan that really has had a lot of harm to a homeowner um, that, uh, that you can really think broadly, how, how has this harm affected them? And, and what do they really need uh, to sort of return to like the place that they would have been if they had really gotten a, a healthy, positive loan? Thank you so much, Rachel. That's great. Um, Nikitra, I'm going to move over to you. Um, and we have a question about uh, real estate owned or REO properties. And the question is that, you know, we know um, that uh, what we see happening with REOs in the previous housing crisis was predicated on a lack of home sales due to the recession. And so um, the question asker is saying that in their experience, they're currently seeing REO properties selling very quickly due to the hot market of home sales. Um, and so do we have any expectations here um, of any implications in the REO space? Yes, thank you. And thank you for the question. We're actually expecting to see REOs peak at about um, the year 2024. And we're likely to see them peak at an additional $175,000. We're reminding everyone that, you know, during this crisis, families have been able to really benefit from rising um, housing costs, right? Like across the nation, we see um, housing uh costs uh, rising all across the nation. So, you know, during the Great Recession, we saw a total of 8 million overall foreclosures. While we're not likely to see that same um, amount of foreclosures, the devastation is falling on communities that have yet to recover during that time. So it's very critical that during this time um, that we see more support for owner occupants. Right now, we know that the Federal Reserve is really investing about $40 billion per month um, in security. So we see activity related to who can access home ownership and who cannot. And because of discrimination, many Black and Brown families lack the down payments um, that they need to really qualify for a loan. So we need to see some really strong down payment assistance so that we can see these consumers be able to get in and um, purchase those homes in our communities. We also need to make sure we don't see these large, massive sales of properties to investors. They're really driving up the cost of housing all over the country. Um, and we know that it, it stabilizes communities when the very people who live in those communities can actually afford to own a home there. Thank you, Nikitra. Um, I, could I jump in as, as well, Kashana? Absolutely. Thanks. I was just going to ask, yeah, does anyone else have anything to add, please? Excellent. Uh, well, so um, my organization, the National Community Stabilization Trust, one of the things we do is uh, we make a subset of REO, uh, specifically uh, now the main participant in our program is Freddie Mac. We make those properties available to um, nonprofits, the community-based purchasers. Um, we... I think that, you know, you are absolutely right. Um, like we are in a very his, like historically unprecedented supply shortage right now. And that applies to distressed properties too. So um, in general, there is a lot of demand for housing um, and there is a lot of demand for distressed properties too. Um, we think that in part because um, the options are better for borrowers in part because people have equity, um, we are gonna see fewer foreclosures than we did coming out of the last crisis. Um, and critically, I would also say that more of those foreclosures will probably be sold to investors earlier on in the process, rather than uh, being taken, quote unquote, into a lender or a services portfolio and becoming our area. Um, so I, I think we can probably anticipate pretty strong demand for all properties, including distressed properties coming out of this crisis, which, which cuts both ways. I mean, it, it, is, um, it, is, it, is, it is true that the problem looks very different than in 2008 or 2009 when we had a glut of, prop, of REO properties and no one really knew what to do with them. That's not the situation that we're in today. Instead, I think what we're seeing is what Nikita was talking about and what some of the other people are talking about in the Q&A about this kind of investor frenzy. Uh, I mean, we risk seeing the conversion of these homes into, you know, from the owner occupied stock uh, to to rental stock, we we risk seeing, uh, especially if home if home sales continue on their trends this year, um, you know, continued escalation in prices and 
um, you know, lower income borrowers being locked out of the market. So uh, it's a really important space to pay attention to. And, um, you know, so I, I would just say that the increased yeah, demand maybe, maybe, properties does couple, couple of ways. That is absolutely right. We have to remember that that we don't see the same levels of property appreciation in black and brown communities. We know that appraisal bias is real and ongoing. So unfortunately, um, even though we see um, this opportunity for people to have stronger home equity, we know that those levels of home equity are not uh, equal across communities. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything else they'd like to add on the REO issue? Okay, we will uh, move on. Um, for you, Deputy Assistant Secretary Berenbaum, um, I'd, I'd like to ask, are there any efforts underway at HUD to ensure that uh, loss mitigation options are provided equitably to all borrowers. I know you spoke to um, the efforts that have been undertaken to make sure that people know that there's uh, forbearance options and um, you've spoken a lot about sort of the outreach um, that has gone on, but wanted to just give you an opportunity to speak specifically to efforts um, that are uh, taking place to ensure that the loss mitigation options are, are provided equitably to all borrowers. Yeah, and uh, I want to assure all of the participants today that Secretary Fudge, and for that matter, President Biden, the very first day of his administration, issued an executive order directing every agency to work internally to ensure equity, not only through its programming and funding, but also in how we ensure fair housing, equal opportunity, equity, and in fact, well, how all the programs are implemented. Uh, and every office at HUD is part of that process. It has begun, it is ongoing, and I'll add it, I think it's very exciting for all of us right now. Uh, with regard to FHA in particular and servicing, if in fact any uh, member of a FIP, a FAP, the public, anyone has a fair housing concern, it should be reported immediately to FHEO in the form of a complaint, a challenge, a call to the FHA hotline. It will be acted upon. This is a very important topic for us. For that matter as well, Secretary Fudge is leading an effort, an interagency effort, which Melody Taylor, affiliated with uh, the Academy, is part of, to look at appraisal and valuation issues and FHA is also very much part of that discussion as well. Uh, it, it, it even connects to the work we do at Housing Counseling again, because many of our agencies alert us to issues uh, that they are seeing, and we in turn are collaborating with the other two offices. Uh, I did note a few questions on the issue of resources to FHEO and staffing overall to HUD. Uh, Shana, if it's okay, I'd like to address that too. Uh, I am delighted that the uh, administration and Secretary Fudge have noted the impact on all of the uh, staff positions that have not been rehired at, at HUD or replaced over the past eight years to a decade. And there is a real focus right now of bringing new talent onto the HUD team. And it's a very exciting time. We're also looking at ways we can speed processes up and in that way, each office, regardless of who it is, FHEO, Housing Counseling, or any other at HUD, will have new resources and hopefully, ideally, new technology to apply to what, we're, what we do together. Thank you so much, David. I was I was coming to you next with the questions about um, resources. I was going to follow up with that, and so you um, you read my mind. So thank you for for um, sharing that perspective for sure. Um, so hopping around just a little bit, and I hope that's okay, um, Rachel. We're going to come back to you with uh, another legally specific question, and of course, if anyone else has anything to share, you should feel free. But the question is: uh, Does disparate treatment treatment need to be intentional in order for the claim to succeed. 
the question asker um, says that they've read that disparate treatment doesn't have to be intentional, um, but that the different treatment itself um, can uh, sort of lead to liability. And so there's just a question here about how to prove disparate treatment. Yes, that is a really great question. And disparate treatment is under the umbrella of intentional discrimination. So we talked about intentional discrimination and disparate impact. So it's under that umbrella. And uh, But if you're demonstrating that a servicer, uh, a, a service provider, a lender is treating different people differently on the basis of a protected classification, that would be under that umbrella. You don't have to prove, for example, that they have uh, negative thoughts or feelings about somebody on the basis of that protected characteristic, but merely showing that they've treated different people differently would, uh, that would be uh, sufficient. You don't have to show kind of a, you know, that, that, that the organization has some intentionality. It's just, it's under that theory. And one of the things that's important about that actually is if you bring a lawsuit, Intentional discrimination does give you the opportunity to get punitive damages, which disparate impact does not. Um, so it does fall under that same, that, that umbrella to give you that opportunity. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, Nikitra, coming back to you, you mentioned zombie foreclosures um, in your presentation. And there was a question that I think you did go ahead and answer about what a zombie foreclosure is, but there's some continuing discussion in the Q&A box because someone has offered an additional definition. And so I just wanted to give you the opportunity to just kind of share um, what a zombie foreclosure is in case um, there were other people who also had that same question. Sure. It, it pretty much is um, a foreclosure that's in limbo. So a borrower may have received a notice of default um, and moved out of the home, but the foreclosure process may not have been completed. Um, and the borrower um, might not need to actually move out of the house. So that's part of um, the kind of limbo status related to a zombie foreclosure. And there are two answers that are in the chart if people want to refer to uh, to those two answers. Wonderful. And then uh, David Sanchez, I think you might be able to speak to this um, as, as well as possibly Nikitra. Um, but the question is that the deadline for requesting a forbearance was June 30th. And um, given the statistics, should the deadline be extended? And I'd also like to add, you know, is there any conversation or do people have any about whether that deadline will be changed or has it been changed or extended? Uh, so I don't want to get the details wrong here uh, and I apologize if I do but my understanding is that uh, FHA has extended the deadline to September 30th as I think David re uh, referenced in his presentation for requesting uh, forbearance um, and I would also ask and Freddie actually do not have a deadline so if you have a Fannie or a Freddie backed loan you can request uh, forbearance without a deadline. Um, you know, I do think that continued access to forbearance um, is is important. And I think uh, over time, uh, the agencies need to do some thinking about how we use this model and make it kind of, that was really uh, expanded significantly for COVID. I mean, we've always done forbearances after natural disasters, but, you know, this is the first time it's ever really been, um, it, you know, deployed at this at this scale um, to to prevent a mortgage crisis. I think you know the agencies should do some thinking about what are um, how do we kind of incorporate this permanently into the loss mitigation picture um, so that borrowers will always have access to forbearance when it's not you know a pandemic. Yeah, if I could jump in there and add sure. as well, David's absolutely right. Uh, we have extended, but the core goal. At AHA, and I suspect also the other uh, you know, GSEs and the like, is to ensure sustainable home ownership. And while the methodology may change from a COVID forbearance to perhaps a different form of waterfall moving forward for servicing options and loss mitigation, the goals should always remain the same. Let it be streamlined, let it be easy for the consumer to access, let it be simple so that servicers will have the resources to implement it quickly. Uh, and I will tell you once again that there's a lot of thought at FHA going on in this space and to stay tuned. 
Great, thank you. Um, any other thoughts around that question or no? Um, along those same lines, um, maybe as a follow-up, um, I know um, David Sanchez, you, you shared with us sort of how people can, um, you know, begin to approach a lender or servicer to ask about forbearance options and sort of you talked about what options are out there. But um, specifically, can you share a little bit about who people should contact when they are um, seeking forbearance? And of course, David Berenbaum, you can speak to this as well. Um, but what should, who should people contact and what should they say when they are uh, approaching a lender or servicer to ask about forbearance options? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I, I would say for someone who, who, who knows, you know, what they want and who understands forbearance, um, you know, sim it's pretty simple. You, you really just need to request a COVID forbearance from your servicer. Um, you don't have to document your hardship. You just have to attest verbally that you've been affected by COVID and, and that's impacting your ability to, to pay your mortgage. So, you know, many uh, servicers are actually allowing um, borrowers to enroll in forbearances just on their customer service websites, and you don't even have to call. Um, you know, obviously they all accept um, kind of uh, forbearance applications. Uh, they're not even really applications, but you know, requests um, um, over the phone. Um, you know, if someone is having a hard time kind of understanding what options are out there and needs more information, you know, that, that's where I think you know some of the explanatory resources that have been put in chat from the CFD, as well as, you know, HUD's really robust housing counseling network is, is honestly where I would recommend people turn to. So I'm sure David has more to say about well, that. Well, thank you, David. We, I welcome the recommendation and I, I hope people follow it. Let, let me simply say that um, there is a percentage of mortgagors who simply have no trust in mortgage servicers or in fact, some of what I'll describe as the retail forms of assistance that are out there. Earlier, we heard uh, from Nikitra, I believe, if I remember correctly, about scams reemerging in the community. And we're receiving real complaints in that space now. As well, uh, you know, if you remember during the financial crisis, even these roadside signs, you know, for help call this number, they're reappearing in communities across the nation again. And that's very unfortunate. Uh, and we hope that AGs will work with CFPB across the nation. What I will say is there are also issues of culture and also practice. You know, I recently was speaking with national capacity on this very issue, serving the Asian Pan Pacific community. There's a hesitancy among many of their constituents of their group in their group to call a mortgage service or even a government agency for help because they, they usually go to family or faith first. And so how we bridge that gap and earn trust is a significant challenge for all of us, regardless of the roles we play. So I'll simply say that housing counseling and particularly the diverse constituency of housing counseling organizations can play a critical role. And one of the things I'm advocating for is for mortgage servicers, to do more right party contact with the housing counseling community. That's a fee for service. It's something that they should support, but it's also something that I hope we'll see investors and uh, FHFA and others, including FHA, do more of in the future. Great, thanks. Um, I'd like to ask a question really of everyone now um, with regard to HUD-backed reverse mortgages. Um, so the question asker is wondering if um, there are any programs that are available to help uh, people who are in HUD-backed reverse mortgages and you know, maybe having uh, difficulties during, during the pandemic. Um, I'll, I'll jump in there. The, the, the simple answer is, is if they are at risk of displacement in any way, uh, many of the national relief programs can be used and they should call a housing counseling organization. In fact, many of the larger groups that do pre-origination counseling and reverse mortgages are creating what I'll describe as special units of counselors who have been specially trained to deal with foreclosure risk for the elder population. Um, it's also an area that we're considering doing much more outreach in as well. 
Uh, often, unfortunately, we do see situations where there are legal issues, and I'll defer to Rachel and others to speak to those. Um, but the, the safety net is ready and available to work with, with elders who are struggling to sustain their homes. Thanks, David. That's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, did you want to add anything there? Or? Sure. I, I, I think that there are uh, reverse mortgage servicers who are uh, better and reverse mortgage servicers who are not as good at uh, implementing the, the regulations around home retention. Um, and so, you know, in light of the, the presentation that I'm giving, I, I think you do want to be aware of who your servicer is, and if you feel like they are not, they're treating your uh, client um, improperly on the basis of race to raise it um, in a complaint. And um, at least in the geographies that I work in, the, those loans are also really targeted on the basis of race. So I think there actually is a lot to be, a lot to think about with reverse mortgages. Um, oftentimes, the homeowner they come to you, maybe you know they haven't been able to pay their taxes and insurance and they may end up in foreclosure for that reason. Uh, but, and, and oftentimes they end up in foreclosure, but those things actually are very resolvable. And unfortunately they end up with, you know, a lot of problems in the foreclosure process, but you also can dig a little deeper and take a look at what that loan is, what the underlying loan is. And it's possible that you can get some other kinds of relief for your client. Um, so just, just something to be aware of. We, we looked at a map that was about a reverse mortgage servicer that was really targeted on the basis of race. And you know, if you do map them, you find that, that oftentimes they are um, targeting certain communities. Thanks, Rachel. Um, before we wrap up, I just wanted to offer all of the panelists uh, one last chance to make any additional comments or give any additional things to say before we close? Okay, uh, it looks like the answer to that question is no. And so with that, we are going to close out today's discussion. It has been an absolute pleasure to uh, speak with this very esteemed panel and have them answer all of your questions. I'd like to thank you all for your participation in today's forum. We do hope that you will join us for the next conversation. Please do check out the NAFTA website for a description and important information on registration for upcoming forums. Thanks to everyone who made today's event possible. I'd also like to thank uh, everyone at HUD as well as our interpreters and our captioner who provided invaluable services to us today. As a reminder, if you are in need of assistance regarding a homeowner foreclosure, please call the hotline at 888-995-HOPE. That's 888-995-4673. Finally, please be on the lookout for a survey which will pop up when this training session ends. The survey will allow you to provide valuable feedback on today's event. Your feedback really is critical to improving these forums because the feedback that you provide will be implemented in forums going forward. It shouldn't take very long to complete the anonymous survey and we do highly value your input. Thank you all again, and we look forward to seeing you at the next NAFTA forum. Take care.